Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Susanna Jones, head of Holton Arms School, an independent college preparatory school for girls grades 3 through 12 that is known for its rigorous academics and diversity. Susanna has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Susanna, for joining us today. Thank you. So you have been at this school through quite a journey. Talk about what you experienced when you first came to the school and, and how the school has transformed over the last years. Well, I came to a, a school that is and always has been just an outstanding institution. And that's a wonderful foundation on which to build. Uh, it's a school that was founded by a, a true visionary, uh, Jesse Moon Holton, who really believed that uh, every girl should have an opportunity to learn in her own way. Uh, she was somebody who really thought that it was important that um, school feel like home. And so she actually built a building that looked like a house because she wanted girls to have the comfort at school that they would, that they would have at home. And uh, she also was really somebody who thought about what the current thinking about education was and also built on the foundation of sort of more traditional education. So I would never call Holton Progressive with a capital P, but it has always been a school that has embraced the latest thinking that, that had merit to it. And that means that the school's a little bit more open to change than many schools are. And uh, when I came there, it was a place that had an excellent repu academic reputation in the greater Washington community. It was a school that had made extraordinary strides in terms of diversity. Uh, the school is uh, and remains one of the most diverse schools in the Washington, D.C. area, socioeconomically um, and uh, racially and ethnically. And that's something that we're very proud of. And really, that's something my predecessor did. What does education mean today? Um, in particular, one hears about the diminishing return on investment, if you can use that, 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 that uh, that term um, of colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. There is a discussion that much of our curriculum is beside the point and our approach to uh, moving people through an industrialized process in which people the same age sit together in classrooms and listen to uh, lectures coming at them, that that might uh, be a holdover from um, the Industrial Revolution days and we're, we're in a information technology age, and we're just not shifting our, our education approaches. What does education mean today? We've, we've done two, two things, really created two programs, maybe it's not quite the right word, but uh, one has to do with global education and the other has to do with the use of technology in education. And the first really was stimulated by a visit to the school from Christine Lagarde, who actually went to Holton. She spent a year uh, her se another senior year at Holton, graduating in 1974, and she came back to visit when she was still the finance minister in France. And uh, she talked about how incredibly important that year she spent at Holton was to her, something that now that she's in Washington, uh, she continues to do. She's our, our best marketer. It's wonderful. But I, I, it made me think if, if that meant that much to her and if we're really talking about educating young women who are going to live in this global world and who are going to be leaders, they need to have that kind of experience as well. And probably not going to Europe, where many of them will go anyway, not that going to Europe isn't a wonderful experience, but we really need to think about the developing world. And so I, I sort of threw this idea out, and this is it's so typical of what Holton is like, saying, you know, I really think we should have these girls at the end of their junior year have an opportunity to go to places in the developing world and, and really be there. It's very different from learning about them in books or whatever. It's being there physically. And it, the idea just took off. And the faculty responded incredibly positively. And I got them involved in the process of deciding where we were going to go and sort of how we were going to structure it. And we sent groups of faculty off that first summer to visit uh, places so that we could sort of set the program up. And uh, what we do now is at the end of junior year, girls have an opportunity to go to Costa Rica, Senegal, or India for approximately uh, two weeks. In each country, we partner with an organization. Our own teachers go with them, so it's very much a Holton experience. In each country, we have 
a school with whom we partner so they have an opportunity to uh, get to know their peers. Uh, <clears throat> there's a service component in each um, program as well. And uh, in Senegal and Costa Rica, there's also a homestay. And uh, we're very excited because uh, this summer, more than half the junior class will go. And these have been truly transformative experiences for the girls and also for the teachers. So the teachers bring those experiences back as well as the girls. So you're building citizens of the world. Absolutely, absolutely. And when they come back, their teachers talk about how they write about these experiences in English. They, they, the, it shows up in their art, whether it's their photography or their ceramics. Uh, and then when they go to college, it really influences what they, what they major in and what they do. So uh, it, it, really, it really has had an impact. And then the other piece, which is similar and different, uh, we were one of the four founding schools of the online school for girls. Uh, and this was really the brainchild of the person who was our uh, director of technology. We created a, a school. It's not a diploma granting school, mm -hmm. but it's a school that uh, offers courses uh, that girls can take online. And it's expanded exponentially in the four years that it's been in existence. Uh, it's also providing a significant amount of professional development opportunities, and not just for teachers in girls' schools, but teachers uh, across the independent school spectrum. Uh, Brad, who was our uh, IT director, has gone off to be the executive director. And um, <clears throat> he really has become one of the leading advocates and authorities on online education uh, in the independent school and, and really beyond the independent school world. Uh, and I think it's really helped us to think about how do you use technology in that way, really using the internet for girls. And, and it's different, I think, how you do that for girls. And the online school for girls has thought very intentionally about how you educate girls most effectively in that environment. So talk about that. Uh Online has, in certain respects, become just a buzzword, mm -hmm. a gotta have, mm -hmm. a snazzy little uh, bright toy. Mm -hmm. um, but very often it, it, it has questionable impact. Mm -hmm. um, and the impact is more one of conviction or we've got to have it because everybody mm -hmm. else has mm -hmm. it. How do you implement your online education component? Well, I think that there are uh, several aspects of that. First of all, I always say that if you were to create an online school for boys, you would have video games, basically. That would be your structure. That's how you pull them in and get them excited. For girls, it needs to be Facebook. Because for girls, it's all about relationships. So you have to think about how you can leverage the tools in a 2.0 environment so you build those relationships that are virtual where you're not actually there physically in a classroom together. And I think that's been one of the most important aspects of the online school for girls. They, they put a real premium on making sure that their teachers, all of whom are teachers from the member schools, there are now over 60 schools involved in the consortium that makes up the online school for girls. So the, the teachers are put through rigorous training program. There's a tremendous amount of accountability for them. And there's an expectation that they're working at the kinds of um, standards that we would expect in our own schools. So it's very much a, uh, a personal, uh, really, expectations of high academic standards. It's not the kind of factory, which is quite honestly the case with many online education providers. Uh, <clears throat> the classes are small. Uh, and, there's, and there's really a lot of individual attention that the girls have. And one of the things that we've learned in this process is that in many ways it's actually a lot harder to teach in an online environment. This is not about putting a lecture up, uh, it, uh, you know, videoing a lecture, just putting up and saying, okay, you go learn that. It's, it couldn't be less that way. It's much, much, much more interactive. Is it real-time interactive? No, it's not. It's asynchronous because these girls are coming from all over the country. Right. So uh, it, it, is, it is purposely asynchronous, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean there isn't personal interaction. And there's this, there are these great stories of uh, a teacher, an, an OSG as we call it, teacher will, will come for let's say a conference or something at one of the member schools where there are girls taking her class but doing it online and they and, see and each other for the first time. And OSG stands for? Online School for Girls. Okay. 
and they'll see each other for the first time. And, you know, so they connect. They're actually in a physical space at the same time. And, you know, they're great loops of excitement. And uh, it's, it's, it's really neat. So it, they have achieved, I think, that goal. In a school setting, uh, the way on the online school for girls works for us is that it gives us an opportunity to have girls take classes that they might not otherwise be able to take. For example, we have so, two sophomores who wanted to add Latin. They were already taking another language, so this would be their second language. We don't offer Latin one in upper school because our girls would take Latin do it in middle school, and they've you know they've they've come up, and we don't usually have enough ninth graders coming in and saying who are new and saying they want to take Latin. But we thought these girls should be able to take Latin, so they're taking Latin one with OSG, uh, <clears throat> and it affords us that opportunity, uh, which is which expands the curriculum that we can offer, which is which is really important. But the other uh, um, development that has happened as a result of our involvement in the online school for girls is that we have teachers who've taught on the online school for girls. We have lots and lots of teachers who've taken their professional development. And we really have made expanding blended learning in the context of our classrooms a priority. So thinking about how you, again, can leverage technology in a way that creates the most effective learning environment. And there's some research that would suggest that a blended learning environment is actually the most effective learning environment. So the, the simplest form is a flipped classroom where you uh, do sort of video a lesson, let's say, mm -hmm. math is a great example, mm -hmm. and uh, the students can watch that at home and do their homework, let's say, but they, let's say they didn't understand something the first time it was explained. The great thing about a video is you can go back and play it again, right. whereas if it was done in class, the teacher said it once, and maybe you could ask the question again, but you're probably not going to keep asking the question more than once. Uh, and then when the students come into class, the teacher really has an opportunity to have the girls work on whatever it is that they were having trouble with and to really give much more differentiated and individualized instruction to the individual needs of the student instead of sort of just teaching everybody in the same way. Do you also use technology the way people used to use textbooks? And what I mean by that is that when a teacher is teaching, generally they are teaching from a textbook that other teachers have written, mm -hmm. other academics have written. Mm -hmm. They might use workbooks that other teachers have also developed. Mm -hmm. Now on the internet are available all sorts of lectures from mm -hmm. different people that might teach a particular problem and a particular approach in a different way, some of which will connect with one cluster of students and some approaches will connect with another cluster of students. Do teachers use the internet and the resources of the internet to also connect Holton Arms to other lectures, other forms, um, other perspectives, so that students who might be having a spot of trouble with math or uh, some other, uh, uh, other uh, element, that they get these different perspectives? You know, that's an interesting question. I assume that girls are being directed to, let's say, Khan Academy, which mm -hmm. would be a great example. Uh, if, they're, if they're having trouble, it's not being used that way in classrooms so much. Right. Uh, but I would assume, I don't know for sure, but I would assume that that is something that somebody would say, well, you know, I certainly do it to my son. I say, well, have you tried, you know, go to Khan Academy and see if there's an explanation there that, that might help you with what you're doing. And so I, I, I assume that people are doing that. We haven't sort of extensively moved into this theory which is, um, which is a really interesting one, that schools will be transformed by this because you can actually get the best instructor from, you know, it might be a university too, it might not be another. Absolutely. And, and um, I think that there's a sense, not that all of our teachers are the very best teachers in the world, I don't want to suggest that, but uh, I, I think that we could probably do that more than we do, but that personal connection that they have with their own teachers uh, is is something that they really rely on and going for extra help and that kind of thing. But I, that's interesting. I should actually find out if we're actually doing well, that. Well, the idea of also feedback loops, I love uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is about the actual mm -hmm. um, community itself of users mm -hmm. contributing knowledge right. and contributing uh, reviews and insights, what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. In a sense, when you are grading students, it's a feedback, feedback loop on how effective you are being as teachers and being able to hone in using technology 
as to where students mm -hmm. are effectively being taught and where they're mm -hmm. not being effectively taught. There is a whole new thinking that schools can bring in mm -hmm. um, that shifts the model from, as you say, that sort of lecture in front of the class mm -hmm. into a much more interactive social media, Facebook mm -hmm. type of approach where people are actually interacting and not only are students adjusting to the lessons that they're learning from teachers, but teachers are interactively adjusting based on the lessons they're learning from students. Absolutely, and I think that, for example, our um, environmental science teacher, who's probably the person using technology in the most sophisticated ways in her classes, um, she uses a, a quiz program so that she regularly quizzes the girls in her class. And they, they, they might do it for homework, but what that means is that she has a much clearer sense and an immediate sense. She doesn't have to grade it. It's, it they're just quick snapshots. It gets graded automatically. So she knows all the time where her students stand. Are they, are they learning this material? So that's a great example. Teachers are much more available to their students well beyond the school day than they used to be. So for example, the chair of the math department, and this isn't particularly innovative technology, but it's using technology in a way that really supports students. So she says to her students, you can email me questions about your homework up until nine o'clock at night. And she's, she's monitoring her email and will answer their questions. So, you know, when I was going to school, you know, I was, I, you know, I wasn't gonna ask my teacher a question about my homework. It wouldn't have been possible at eight right. o'clock at night. Uh, so I think that kind of interaction and, and that immediate, you, you don't have to wait for your answers, which you know, may not be teaching a lot of patience, but it also means you can move forward uh, quickly, uh, which is good for the learning process. And it also means that you're recruiting for a different type of competence going yes. forward. You're recruiting for, um, for communication competencies, certainly in classroom competencies, but communication competencies, mm -hmm. technical facility, mm -hmm. Um, your investments, which in a previous era might have been a capital campaign to, to build new buildings, today it might be a capital campaign to actually increase your access to electronic mm -hmm. um, uh, tools that, mm -hmm. that help you to, do, um, to interact with your students in a more effective way, maybe even eliminating the need for another building. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. how could be yes. How will Holton Arms develop over the next years? Well, I think that we really want to continue on the on the continuum that we're on. Uh, we are going to focus very intently on STEM, which has long been a strength of ours. Uh, really building partnerships with area institutions, particularly. Uh, colleges and universities. We, we had a board meeting last night and actually we're talking about this. We have a board member who's really helping us uh, to do this, which is very exciting and the faculty is excited about doing it as well. A and thinking about uh, how to build the program some, to build, but the program's already very strong. Uh, and uh, it has components such as our science research project where girls again at the end of their junior year go and spend a substantial portion of their summers working in a lab doing real science. Uh, and obviously that's a, another really valuable experience for them because it helps them to understand whether science is something that they want to pursue. Because they're seeing it's very different from doing science in, uh, doing science in a lab, obviously, than it is doing it in a classroom. And we are going to probably, we're, we haven't decided this definitively, but probably create some sort of a certificate so that you will uh, really go through a, a, a course of a program where you're emphasizing the STEM disciplines. Obviously, you'll still take English and history and language, but uh, that will be kind of your, your focus, your emphasis, and then you'd get some kind of a certificate at the end of that process. So I think the, the idea of continuing to strengthen the programs that we have, but this piece about outreach, about using and developing partnerships in this, I mean, this city, I mean, I've lived in New York and Los Angeles and outside of Hartford, Connecticut, I've taught in all schools in all of those areas. And this area it truly is unique in terms of the opportunities that are, that are available. 
And of course, we have alumni and parents who are tied to all kinds of organizations and capitalizing on those connections as well, which of course just builds the strength of your community, uh, is something else that we're, we're trying to do. So that will be one piece of it. The global education program, we're also creating a certificate for that as well, because we think that not just kind of talking about these experiences and having girls have the opportunity to do them, but sort of pa packaging them, not to use too uh, kind of, I don't know, markety a word, but give something that particularly colleges can look at and say, oh yes, okay, we can, we can put a name on that that she did. And so in terms of global education, there'll be uh, a series of expectations that girls need to meet, including going on one of these junior journeys, but taking the certain uh, certain courses, taking language through their senior year, doing their senior project on a global topic, uh, possibly getting credit for some other extracurricular activities that they might do, such as Model UN, uh, and then it, doing those, fulfilling those uh, requirements, they would get a certificate as well. Uh, so I think that those pieces are important to the program. It's really continuing to work towards more experiential learning, more interdisciplinary more learning, more connecting with the community uh, around us. It seems that the common theme is an outwardly facing mm -hmm. orientation. Yes. Uh, schools, through their history, um, generally have to, as they're building their their uh, concepts and as they're uh, developing their programs face inward. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is that we already have that mm -hmm. very strong base. Now is the time to face outward. Mm -hmm. You're using technologies, you're using partnerships, you're using uh, foreign exchange uh, programs and, foreign uh, and, and uh, international experience programs, you're using language, uh, you're using internships uh, to, to take the Holton Arms idea and now take that out into the world and, and retain Holton Arms as a base uh, for which, uh, uh, through which these girls might share those experiences with one another. That is exactly right. The great thing about Holton though, again, is this is something Holton has always done. So the school originally was in the district, it moved to its location in Bethesda in 1963. When they were uh, downtown, the girls could walk to the National Gallery almost. They could walk to the Phillips Collection and they were very close. So they would go to the National Gallery at lunch. Uh, you know, apparently the story goes that the art history has always been a, an important part of the school's curriculum. And the story goes that the guards at the National Gallery knew exactly what they were supposed to do. The girls would walk into the gallery and they would say, oh, you need to look at that painting. You need to. So it's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing that we, I'm not sure we'll get to that exact point, but really, using these resources and going back to, it's not that we haven't been, we have, we're just doing it more and really building on what that heritage was. Well, Susanna Jones, thank you so much for sharing your, your experience with us, for sharing the great programs of Holton Arms, and thank you so much for your insights. Well, thank you. This was fun. I really enjoyed it.